We're here with Dame today, uh, and we are going to talk about sleep apnea because there's this whole concept that we see all the time. To commonly, you probably see as well, mate. Uh, where um, uh, we basically see these people who are told they have uh, sleep apnea, and they're basically told the only suggestion they, or the only suggestion they get really, is CPAP, and that is it. And they get stuck to these machines for the rest of their life. But there's a lot of different options there, so we're going to talk about that today. Um, I've worked with Dame for quite a while now, uh, amazing guy, he's a dentist, a good friend of mine as well. Uh, we often work together with um, uh, some difficult cases as well. So we're going to have this little chat around sleep apnea and, um, and go through this and, and give you a little bit more insight as to what is actually um, uh, going on with sleep apnea, what is it, what drives it, how does it occur and give you some insights as to why you potentially might not need sleep apnea, you might have some other options available too as well. All right, so let's start from the start, dude. How did you, um, you get into sleep apnea? How did you end up in this position? You're a dentist. Yeah. How did you get down this path? Well, I actually started down this path through learning about TMD, which is um, TMJ disorders or disorders about the yeah. jaw joint. Um, so I was fascinated by how the jaw joint can cause so many problems for people, such as like headaches, um, jaw locking, clicking, teeth grinding, etc. And through the courses I was doing, everyone was always talking about if you're going to treat TMJ disorders, you need to look at the sleep and the breathing. I was like, okay, how come this is coming about? And the more I dug into it, the more I realized, oh, most TMJ disorders are linked to sleep apnea or breathing disorders or sleeping disorders. And if you want to be able to treat someone with TMJ properly, you have to then treat the sleep and their breathing at the same time. So most of this was uh, mostly related to um, sleep bruxism, which is teeth grinding. And what we we're now realizing in dentistry, that we all thought tooth grind or bruxism is caused from stress, which it is, but what we don't realize is a stress to our body can also be not sleeping properly or not breathing properly, which can be manifested like snoring or suffocating at night, which is sleep apnea. Yeah, so... Um, it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Like, there's this constant thing I keep hearing all the time that, hey, you grind your teeth, you must be stressed, you grind your teeth, you must be stressed, and we see this all the time and, uh, and hear this from, you know, different patients that are coming through our offices, and it's not necessarily that simple, is it? It's not like just because you're grinding your teeth is because you're stressed. We see tons of different reasons for it. Mm. Um, what are some of the different reasons you've come across? Yeah, past? well, it's actually fascinating. When you say it's stress, what I, when I started digging into it, I was just thought, oh, it's all just airway and sleep. But then mm. I realized, oh, there can be other stresses. I've had some patients come in to me saying, oh, I was, um, I was sick last week, I was grinding a lot, but then when I got better or the grinding stopped or it's gone back to normal again. Mm. And then some, I've had some females who say, oh, I was like um, my time of the month or hormonal changes and they were grinding more than it went away. And then um, what I was realizing is all these were all other stresses as well, uh, which some instances are uncontrollable from our means as, um, as uh, health practitioners because we're always going to have like, you know, late for work stress, um, foods that we eat by accident which are bad for us or get sick, etc. But then there are the things which we can control such as um, sleeping problems or breathing problems. Um, and physically as the dentist, um, there are things we can do to help those problems. So then if we do have other stresses which we um, can't avoid, such as being late for work or a deadline or um, eating something bad, etc. Then our body was able is more able to adapt and um, tolerate those stresses. Yeah, and look, one of the things that we often see in, in practice too, just from a, a, a physical structural perspective, mm. um, is the influence that um, uh, this grinding has on, on brain health. Mm. Uh, so we see quite often when people are grinding just on the one side. Sometimes what they're actually trying to do is really wind the brain up on that side and get stimulation, like the brain is really flat and they mm. just can't get the brain up, so the brain's kind of jamming these teeth together to stimulate that trigeminal pathway to get the stimulation to increase arouse it or try and stabilize the brain health itself. Mm. Uh, and it's one of the things that we commonly see that, that is missed by um, uh, various practitioners around mm. where they just forget about the involvement in the brain and all this type of stuff. Mm. Um, is there anything that you commonly see? Like, what's the biggest trigger that you see for in practice in terms of bruxism, uh, the grinding thing? What's the thing that you look yeah. at? The most common thing, dental wise, would be I would see imbalances in their bite. Like, yeah. for instance, I, I'll just use this um, jaw as an example. I'll see, like, for instance, they're biting on one side higher than the other, or the jaw may be um, skewed off. And then we see, oh, that's an orthodontic problem. But then we don't realize, ah, by altering the bite, it's going to alter how these two jaw joints sit inside the head. And if the jaw joints then start moving around, it's going to impact how it um, moves to, uh, um, the skull as well. 
Um, so we have to, but as dentists, we're just thinking, oh, it's all the teeth, all the teeth. We just want nice straight teeth in a good occlusion, etc. But we've got, we forget that uh, teeth are connected to jawbone, which is then connected to the head, which is connected to a person. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah. one of the big fallacies in dentistry. We're too, we're too tunnel visioned on what we're looking inside the mouth. Forget that it's connected to a human being here. Yeah. We <laughs> see a lot of time going like mm-hmm. the um, practice, structural practitioners forget that there's a person on the other side of the. I think you're correcting or adjusting it. Yeah, not, not looking big enough, not looking wide enough. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is um, one of the things as well that we, that we commonly see as well with this is um, the whole uh, involvement of, of TMJ in, in, in this whole component where sometimes it can actually be caused and sometimes it can be effect as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, if we look at this a bit broader now, so how does all mm. this from, in your perspective in clinical practice, fit in with um, airway dysfunction? Yeah, okay, so let's go back to the bruxism. I might actually yeah. use this little model I've got here. So most of the time when I see people with bruxism, I'm always, nowadays, I'm always now looking for the airway and if they can sleep properly. Mm. Because those are normally, if they can't, um, if they can't breathe properly or if they can't sleep properly, those are normally big red flags that something else is going on with their overall health, not their teeth. So, um, and majority of patients, they will normally say, oh yeah, I sleep fine, until I then start poking them and say, are you sure? Like, how often do you wake up at night? Um, do you go to the toilet often? Do you feel fresh in the morning? When they think about it, like, oh yeah, I wake up maybe two or three times a night, and then I told them, do you know you should not wake up at all? And I'm like, really? I thought it's normal. And yeah. they have that light bulb moment, like, oh, maybe there is something wrong with me. And then, you know, uh, we have our medical questionnaire, uh, which I fill out and it always asks, do you snore? Most of the time they'll write, no, I don't snore. But then when I ask them in person, they're like, actually, I think I do snore. So mm-hmm. there's lots of these things most people don't realize is going on until we probe them. And then how that in- um, interrelates with the grinding. So what we find is, um, most people will snore if they lie on their back and um, go to sleep because the muscles in our bottom joint, our tongue, tend to relax and then everything collapses backwards. And that jaw falls back and that's locks correct. push the tongue into the airway. Mm, that's correct, Trev. Mm. So when everything blocks, falls backwards, then we um, have to call you breathing and then that can manifest as snoring or sleep apnea, which is suffocation. So then when that happens, the brain then panics and tells the jaw and the tongue to move forward to open airway so it can breathe better. Yep. But then that's the mechanism of when we start clenching and grinding the teeth. Yep. And then normally when I explain that to patients, like, oh, so that's why I'm grinding. That's why I'm having difficulty sleeping and yeah. breathing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and we see this especially when people are getting to REM, isn't it? That's kind of the biggest yeah. phase where, mm. where the brain's kind of going, hey, if you don't breathe now, you're going to die. Yeah. So we've got to get you out of REM, so we've got to increase, yeah. the, um, we've got to increase brain arousal. That's to do that, let's jam those teeth together to yeah. get them up and going. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, what, that's exactly correct. Yeah, most of the research has been showing that um, most br- sleep bruxism predominantly happens in um, REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. Yeah. And that's our um, active dreaming phase or sleep sleep. But what's also important about REM sleep is uh, that's a power sleep where we do a memory consolidation. So mm-hmm. then most of these, if we extrapolate back to our patients, then most of these patients who are grinding, they're the, they're the ones with like brain fog or they can't remember things or they're feeling they're not as bright or um, as quick as they used to be mm-hmm. years ago because they, they're not getting that proper sleep which is consolidating their memory and Helping and learn new things during the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a, a, a bigger, broader issue, isn't it? Because mm. in, in reality, when we start looking at this kind of thing, we know that REM sleep kind of increases every cycle we go through. It's the fourth mm. and fifth cycle that we really get most of our brain development and repair and growth mm. happening. Yeah. Um, and if we're waking up in those earlier that earlier parts of the sleep, we're not getting into that fourth and fifth cycle, so we're just not getting brain development and brain repair happening yeah. as well. Mm. That's correct. Especially, uh, we're seeing this happening in kids <laughs> now as well. We all used to think sleep apnea was um, the, the disease of the elderly man who's overweight. But I myself have sleep apnea and I'm in my 30s, perfectly healthy, I exercise, not overweight, but I was diagnosed sleep apnea close to seven years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for me, it was surprising, but then I realized, oh, that makes sense. I do get tired. I do grind my teeth at night. I did yeah. snore, but when I went to the sleep station, I had sleep apnea. And majority of the people I'm now seeing with sleep apnea are um, healthy um, males or females who aren't overweight, they're in a healthy condition, but they're in their 20s or 30s and they're being diagnosed with sleep apnea. So it's no longer a disease of um, the elderly gentleman who's overweight um, snoring down the house. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, now we're also seeing it in our kids 
as young as like um, in infancy, being born with sleep apnea or developing sleep apnea mm. as when a toddlers. Yeah. yeah. So what are the key things? So when we look at um, infants, let's, let's, let's start young. Mm. Yeah, let's start with these young yeah. kids. So what are the key signs that you see of, of kids really having uh, airway problems? Yeah, so in kids, predominantly it'll be, they'll be snoring or um, they'll be grinding their teeth at night, again, because they can't breathe properly. Yeah. Um, then it can be other issues outside of the teeth, um, such as like wetting the bed or waking up a lot, um, having night terrors, um, sleepwalking. Um, sometimes tonsillitis all the time, or ear infections, or yeah. sometimes we may see it um, as like venous pooling under eyes, which are like those bags under the eyes. Um, and then with dental, there's also dental issues which we see as dentists. We'll see them with like um, malocclusions, which it can be like an open bite where the teeth aren't touching. So the teeth could be all apart all the time because they're trying to breathe through their mouth. Yeah. Or we may see um, they've got what we call an um, uh, overjet where the bottom jaw is all the way back here instead of um, where it needs to be. And the back bottom jaw is back here. Again, it's going to block the airway. So yeah, those are, and I'm seeing it more and more commonly these days in kids. And it's funny the whole uh, nightmares, night terrors thing. Like it's, mm. it's kind of cutting of research now that we now starting to understand that uh, a lack of airflow through the frontal sinus mm. uh, is a big contributor to um, uh, to things like enuresis and nightmares and night terrors and things mm. like this. But uh, the, the funny thing for me, I, I go back and I start thinking about stuff that I've read over the years. Mm. Uh, and I remember, I, and I don't know if you read or not, but I remember reading a book which was uh, written somewhere in the late 1800s by George Caitlin, mm. um, mm. where he went around and he looked through all the Red Indian tribes and he found oh, a tribe yes. in Wisconsin. Wis, uh, Wisconsin. Mm. If I get that word out, Wisconsin, there's an interesting mm. word for that. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, mm. and his Red Indian tribe, he found that they had very low levels of scoliosis, very low levels of um, mm -hmm. uh, malocclusion problems, yes. uh, very low level of infancy deaths in, um, mm -hmm. in the cemeteries, which yeah. is quite rare for that time. Mm -hmm. and he spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out why that was. And yeah. one of the things he found was mm -hmm. that um, the actual tribe believed that it was the role of every female in the in the um, in the tribe to stay mm -hmm. up overnight mm -hmm. and um, pinch the mouth shut of any kids that opened their mouth because mm -hmm. they believed that they opened their mouth the the um, uh, spirits would come in and torment their oh, dreams. Wow. <laughs> yeah? And this is like 1800s, wow. 1700s, yeah. these Red Indians have worked this out. <laughs> yeah. And now science is starting to show that, hey, if you're having airway problems, you're going to get nightmares and night terrors. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, like, science has wow. taken so long to catch up on things we've known mm. uh, or been observed for centuries. Yeah. Already. Isn't it just amazing? Okay. It is, yeah. We need to reintroduce like, getting our mums to pinch our mouths. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, that's pretty much where this all starts. It starts at with mouth breathing, if we're mouth breathing, it pretty much changes how a whole um, facial and cranial structure grows. And if, yeah. the, um, if the cranial structure doesn't grow properly, that's when the jaw joint gets jammed back, the airway gets blocked, we develop sinus, tonsil issues, etc. And one day, well, with kids, when I see them, um, the main thing I'm telling them is to breathe through their nose and keep the mouth closed. And still tell them with adults, but with adults, you can't fix it, you can only manage it. With kids, we can um, cure and prevent it because they're still growing and they can yeah. outgrow it. Yeah. yeah. Just, just as a side guys, I, I find mm. you don't have to have night terrors or nightmares as such. They can just be restless sleepers. Oh, that's absolutely. Rest, rest yeah. Bed, just waking mm, yeah. in the bed, just that can be a precursor. Yeah. Those kids that you put them down this way and they wake up facing this way, yeah. they're kind of all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Blankets are all over the place. Yeah. 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 <laughs> These are common things for kids yeah, as well, yeah. Mm. Um, and it's interesting you're talking about touching on the, the facial development thing. So mm. um, this is a, a really interesting topic that I've had a lot of interest on for, for quite a while now. I remember mm. reading some of the work Weston Price and yes, some of these yeah. guys mm. who have done um, some studies looking at facial development and, mm. and the link with Western style diet to changes mm. in facial development, how we should be this broad, open kind of face mm. and we tended to get narrower and narrower and narrower, mm. almost going back to being more dog-like uh, with our uh, function. Mm. Um, believing to be because of immune regulations mm. and um, an inflammation which is changing airway function mm. uh, and basically not allowing infants to keep their tongues in the roof of their mouth so we're getting abnormal growth. Mm. Pretty much, yeah, and you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, when you were telling me about that Wisconsin study, I was just rem reminding me about uh, Weston Price and he looked into all that with um, um, indigenous populations. Basically, he went and looked at the um, populations who um, lived off the land on their, like, you know, hunter-gatherer diet, 
and he looked inside their mouths and saw, oh, it had perfect occlusion, nice, wide, broad jaws, big smiles, and no tooth decay as well. Mm. And then he would look at the Western diet, um, much smaller jaws, um, tooth decay everywhere, crooked, crowded teeth, malocclusions, etc. And then what he did was he then um, introduced Western diet to some of these um, hunter-gatherer populations. And he found over the generations, their jaws started growing, um, shrinking, getting smaller, getting more malocclusions, um, crooked teeth, um, getting more tooth decay as well. And it was actually being all to their, their um, diet was changing. Um, their, they weren't using their muscles as much. Um, their whole structure, the environment was just changing for them. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's amazing how that kind of has broader ramifications then as well. Mm. Like we know that you know, uh, somewhere like 30 to 40 percent of all the import into the cerebellum comes from both TMJs. Like it's a mm. huge thing. I remember what, uh, reading some studies, uh, I think a couple of years ago now, where they took rats and all they basically did mm. is put amalgam fillings on one side yes. to un unlevel their bite and yeah. induce scoliosis right mm. through their spine and yeah. remove them and straighten their spines back out again. Mm. Uh, so we, we like to think of the, the face as being this kind of thing that just sits here and allows you to talk and yeah. gives you this cosmetic appearance. But mm. when we start looking at studies like this, we start seeing this has Mm. really broad ramifications yeah. for, for brain health mm. and, and structure and, and uh, the whole actual human existence rather mm. than just the face itself. Yes, exactly, yeah, it was so correct about it. It's funny that this actually just happened to me just two weeks ago. I was um, using an old uh, splint of mine, which I haven't used for a while. I just wanted to see if it still works. So I used it in my mouth for a couple of days, and since it was an old splint, my teeth had moved a bit. And it moved, and it moved my teeth back, um, or moved the ball to an all position. But when it did that, I could feel, ooh, my jaw was getting off. I felt my mm. gait was getting off as well. How I walked, how I was holding my posture, and it wasn't until my teeth settled back to where they currently are now that I felt, ooh, it's all normal again. Yeah. So yeah, those few days was really enlightening to me that yeah, how just a few millimeters difference could really affect the jaw joint and even my neck posture and my gait and how I walked, etc. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. We um we're in the process. I'm in the process of co-writing a paper at the moment, which is being mm. hopefully we publish soon on um uh, with a couple of soccer players that were mm. uh, were, were in um, a little while back and. Uh, uh, one of the things that we actually found, these guys had recurrent, or one of the guys had recurrent adductor problems just over and over and over again. Mm. And, and just basically shifting the incisor just slightly, mm. completely changed their pelvic tone yeah. and got rid of the whole osteitis pubis. Mm. Wow. It was absolutely amazing. We're in the process of writing up that case now. Yeah. But, um, you yeah, know, mm. we, we kind of, for a long time, dentistry and even the mm. greater community seen teeth as just these cosmetic things that you used to chew. But yeah. we're now starting to <laughs> understand these are hard white into the central nervous system, mm. it's almost part of the brain itself. Yeah, mm. yeah we know that the trigeminal nervous is almost an extension of the brain uh, mm. and these are directly in your teeth, they're not mm. simple things. Yeah. Alright, so if we start looking, say we move on a little bit later into adults mm. now. Yeah. So mm. what are the key symptoms that we see in adults with uh, apnea problems? What are mm. the key things we're looking for airway wise? Yeah, so adults they don't normally have as much night terrors or nightmares. They don't normally, like the funny thing with adults, um, the main distinction between adults and children Children, when they have uh, sleep breathing problems, they'll act out. We'll see them as the ADHD kids or the kids who are um, uncontrollable. Yeah, they lose that inhibition. Which mm, is off. That's yeah. correct. And we just, think, shuts down. Mm, we just think he's a hyper kid or he had too much recordio or something like that. Uh, but with adults, it's the complete opposite. They don't act out. Uh, we tend to get a lot more tired. So the adults will be the ones who will be complaining of fatigue, uh, maybe headaches, uh, more I generally find more chronic um, chronic body pain. These could be like our fibromyalgia patients or our TND patients. Um, these you know, they'll always be sometimes they'll be complaining of the snoring or they can't focus or concentrate properly at work or just um, sleepy behind the wheel. Um, can't um, normally by midday or that one two p.m. area they'll be feeling they just need to have a nap to um, get going through the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. They just they really do tend to get this brain fatigue, don't they? Yeah, that's correct. Um, yes. and this is where we start mm. seeing the level of human development change between kids and adults. Mm. So with the kids, we don't have our frontal lobes developed yet, mm. and when we don't have our frontal lobes developed. We we don't have the ability to sense social behaviours mm. correctly as yet. But then yeah. as we get to adults and we have that frontal lobe um, mm. uh, development now in uh, when we have these issues we, we don't misbehave as such yeah <laughs> what we tend to see is a lack of the cortical tone yeah so we mm. basically shut down mm. so yeah uh, we lose the ability to goal set the plan motivational issues anxiety mm. issues Definitely. all these things really start driving up yeah um, mm. so with the fatigue mm. 
I know one of the things that I've seen with sleep apnea is it's really a big problem in the morning mm. more than anything else. Have yes. you experienced that as well? Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely the morning is normally the hardest time for most of these patients. Uh, getting out of bed um, or just feeling um, refreshed to just even um, just take, um, just open their eyes sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, definitely the morning is the worst time of the day for them. And then normally I would find once they get out of bed, um, they can push through, get that cup of coffee, Gives them a boost of energy. Then normally by the mid uh, mid afternoon, that's when their energy levels are plummeting again, yeah. and they struggle to even get through to the evening. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. in the morning as well, not, that's when they can normally manifest with other um, signs and symptoms, um, such as like TMJ disorders. They'll be waking, saying, "Oh, my jaw is more sore in the morning, or feeling more stiffness in the cheeks, or more headaches in the morning." Yeah, because they've been overworking their jaw muscles to grind their teeth to help them breathe as well. Yeah. So those are normally what I would see in the morning with these adults. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, awesome. That sounds good. All right. So um, if we move a little bit forward again from there, um, mm. what are some of the key treatment options that you see at mm. the moment available for these type of people? Yeah. So from uh, a dentistry perspective, yeah. what do you guys have available? Mm. So in dentistry, what we normally use, uh, we normally use these splints called mandibular advancement splints. And how these work, they go on the top and the bottom jaw. And that this one has these little arms on the side which help hold the bottom jaw forward. So if this was someone lying on their back, the bottom jaw can't fall back anymore. And we can also use this to help push the bottom jaw more forward. In doing so, by pushing more forward, it's going to open the airway a lot more so it can breathe better. So this is the main, me uh, main mechanism we use in the dentistry um, to help open the airway and treat the sleep apnea. The benefits of these as well is um, this can also help with their TMJ disorders of their bruxism. Mm. So for one thing, it's, um, this is a very strong nylon material which is going to protect their teeth. So if they're grinding and wearing down their teeth, they won't be doing that anymore because now they're grinding with a splint. Um, what it also does with TMJ is going to unload the jaw joint. So for instance, if we're biting down heavily like this, we're overloading the jaw and the, mm. um, and the joint. But maybe we put something in between the teeth, the teeth are no longer touching. So yes, they may still clench and grind, but they're no longer touching, they're no longer overloading the jaw joint. So we're putting it in a more rehabilitated position so they can... Opening the space up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Opening it. I have to say, I, I love this splint. This yeah. splint is absolutely oh, yeah. beautiful. I, I, just, I just love this. I mean, this thing's a work of art. Yeah. Um, I'm used to seeing so many times the big... Yeah, big so this is the older model just, ones. Yeah, they're mm. the old days. Yeah, where you kind of look like... Yeah. <laughs> it's, like it's the old days of having, you know, like the metal braces, which are kind of just exactly. everywhere. look like, you know, train tracks. It's like, this is the old days of um, yeah. airway stuff. Mm. This new stuff is just so thin. It's so small. Definitely. You, you don't even notice you're wearing it yeah. anymore. It's, it's so revolutionary. And sometimes you even use... Like, I guess sometimes you can use even smaller um, splints for sleep apnea. So if they're like a very mild sleep apnea patient, sometimes you just use something which goes on the top jaw instead. And this um, this one, how this one works, has this little ring at the front which holds the bottom jaw forward. So especially if they've got TMJ disorders, sometimes they can't handle having too much things in their mouth. So sometimes they may go, okay, you've got a TMJ disorder, um, you've also got sleep apnea, I think that other splint may be too bulky for you and too much load for your jaw and your muscles. So let's go with something like this first, um, which will still unload your jaw joint, protect your teeth from grinding, but will also still help with sleep apnea and help you breathe better. And I find the majority of patients have been able to use this to treat their sleep apnea and don't even need to go to the um, double um, or bigger splint later on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and I always, uh, I always love these things when you when you yeah. put these little things. You, you really <laughs> quickly understand how the brain just wants to know what's in your mouth. Exactly. So the tongue just goes looking for it. You yeah. Just, you just through these little holes. I know. Yeah. It's it, yeah. A curious thing. Yeah. It's like when you have something stuck in the side of your teeth. You just gotta just constantly keep moving with your tongue in it. It's like yeah. the brain just needs to map the face like mm. crazy. It's got such a massive vested interest yeah. in it. Yeah. Because it's, it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. these are these are awesome splints. I just I just love these new this new technology. Yeah, yeah. It's such a simple thing to use. It's yeah. not irritating like you, so it doesn't damage people's jaws or irritate yeah. the, the mandible or mm. uh, uh, or the um, TMJ like we used to see some of these older, bigger mm. splints do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And look, from from our perspective, um, for us, it's all about getting information down. Yeah. It's like that's correct. Yes. We got to get the information mm. down. If you have a an airway that is this size, mm. uh, and now all of a sudden it goes, uh, you get information that's kind of shrinks it down, so now that airway mm -hmm. goes from this size to this size. That's correct. Uh, and the net result yeah. now is you get less stuff through it. Yes. Uh, and we see mm -hmm. so many dietary things that we can shift with people mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, changing fat ratios, changing mm -hmm. carbohydrate content, yeah. specific food sensitivities. Definitely. Um, even looking at things like um, 
the, um, uh, the ratio of, of one aspect of TH1 to TH2 immune function, the mm. influence of that, such as stress and vestibular function, all these mm. kind of things that influence it as well. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. The, um, okay, so if we go a little bit further from that as well, snoring. Mm. Um, this is, it seems to be a, a growing problem. Mm. Uh, have you noticed that as well? Like, oh, definitely, yeah. As I was saying before, yeah. like, we're now seeing it more and more in our kids. And it's just, um, it's more of our media perception has skewed how, how serious we see snoring. Like, we'll see like the movies or TV shows where the um, husband or someone is snoring. We yeah. just laugh it off and think, oh, it's funny, he's snoring, he's asleep. But we don't realize is that guy is he's suffocating. Yes, it's funny in the TV show, but he's not breathing properly. But what that has done is made us, it's desensitized to how serious the snoring actually is. Yeah. So I've seen many kids and the mother goes, oh yeah, Lord Johnny snores, but it's pretty cute. I'm like, no, it's not cute. <laughs> your your <laughs> son. Nothing is, cute about yeah. dying. <laughs> no, he's suffocating at night. The snoring means he's not breathing properly. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about re-education about um, our patients telling her that, hey, that snoring issue, you may think it's, um, yeah, I'm not snoring loud, but it's actually a problem. Um, yeah, so when we start looking at SPO2 readings, mm. um, uh, diaphragm movement, structural mm. things, and even uh, just showing people how to walk properly. So a lot of people, yes. when they walk, don't rotate at all from the shoulders. They kind of keep the shoulders still and just swing mm. their hands. Yeah. So you don't get the thoracic cage movement. Mm. Uh, and we've seen readings, haven't we, of like 91, 92, just showing people to walk for 30 steps correctly. All of a sudden, mm. their readings go back up to 99, 100% saturation just yeah. from getting movement and getting the oxygen levels back again. Mm. Um, it's quite interesting how simple sometimes some of the solutions can be. You don't mm. necessarily need complex solutions to all this type of stuff. Yeah. Mm. Uh, sometimes the, the solutions can be very, very, very easy. Yes, definitely, yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting you bring it up with the diaphragm because the diaphragm is basically our core. And most of these patients, if they're um, mouth breathing, they're not using their diaphragm. They're using their accessory muscles, their chest and um, intercostal and pe pectoral muscles. Um, which aren't yeah. our main breathing muscles. So then we see these people with their neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, etc. It's all because they're not breathing properly. They're not mm -hmm. using a diaphragm. They're using overworking all this area, which then transfers up to here. We see them as our headache patients or TMJ patients. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there a way that um, people can check for sleep apnea at home? Um, easiest way is to just see if, you're, um, see if you're snoring and if you have someone at home like family member, um, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, etc. Just ask them, do, you, do I snore at night? Um, there are also apps out there um, which can monitor your snoring. So there's one called uh, Snore, Snore Lab. Um, yeah, I yeah. have seen some of these new ones coming out mm. now where they are uh, basically uh, um, audio detectors. They're picking up noises and stuff. Pretty and much. track when you're making yeah. noises throughout the night. Yeah, they're almost, um, they're, like in sleep studies, there's four levels of sleep studies. Um, level one is the highest level, which is where you go into hospital. Level four is the most basic sleep study. And some of these apps are almost getting to the same level as a level four sleep study. Yeah, so they're, mm, they're not as um, precise to diagnose, yes, you've got sleep apnea, but it's a good, um, good, cheap, effective, or sometimes free option to just see, oh, am I snoring or why am I so tired in the yeah. morning when I wake up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and mm. also, there are little things that we can often use as well. Like, we can get mm. SpO2 monitors really cheaply mm. nowadays off uh, the internet and things like this yes. as well. Mm. So, um, and we have a couple in our office here that we sometimes loan out to people. So, mm. we just. You know, it's a little um, wristwatch or something similar. You plug yeah. a thing on your finger and it will just record your oxygen levels overnight. And again, mm. whilst it isn't a full sleep study or mm. it doesn't tell us all the factors, at least it gets an idea whether you're breathing or not yeah. overnight, which is kind of uh, mm. a little bit critical. Yeah, it. it gives us that gauge way to say, oh, my, my app showed me I was snoring a bit. Maybe I should go talk to my doctor or dentist about sleep apnea and snoring about what to do next. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. 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 Any other questions over there, Mark? Just with the brace, the, the night guards and things, are they mm. permanent things for people? Does it keep them off CPAPs? What's that? Mm, yeah, so, yeah, so these, are, <coughs> these are splints we use. If they're adults, most likely they'll need to use it for life every night. The reason yeah. being is if they've got sleep apnea, the airway is small or blocked. Um, even with surgery, surgery doesn't always fix the sleep apnea. Um, they normally still need something afterwards. So majority of the time they're adult, it's management. They'll need something to uh, manage the sleep apnea. With kids, um, normally we don't treat them with splints. We're looking to try help their airway grow because they're still growing. That's how we can fix them. So with kids, we're normally looking at doing the mm -hmm. orthodontics to grow their jaw, move their jaw forward, open the airway. Um, sometimes they may need surgery, such as like a nasal surgery or um, sinus surgery or 
remove tonsil adenoids as well, which will then open the airway more, help you grow better. So yeah, with these splints, adults will need to most likely use them forever, but with kids, that's where yeah. you can fix it. Yeah, yeah, and we're kind of similar in that sense as well. So mm -hmm. there's no doubt um, the younger you get, it, the, the more mm -hmm. more likelihood you are to get over it, that's for certain. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've also seen uh, and with people who've had uh, full slip apnea and need a CPAP and stuff like this, mm -hmm. uh, breath cessation rates, so how often they're stopping breathing overnight and things like this, you can change quite mm -hmm. significantly through mm -hmm. reducing inflammation and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we often see that often helps a lot of adults, and, and maybe not necessarily cure is probably the wrong word, but mm -hmm. definitely improve their performance, mm -hmm. is increasing muscular tone in the throat as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, and mm -hmm. mainly the big way of doing that is by increasing vagal tone. Yes. And this is where we start mm -hmm. seeing a big link go round and round and round and mm -hmm. round. Because what we know is when we start getting trigeminal problems from the jaw, mm -hmm. that kind of inhibits and shuts down the mm -hmm. vagus nerve, and mm -hmm. then that kind of shuts down the throat, mm -hmm. and we keep going round and round in circles with yeah. it. So mm. one of the things that we often look at is get the inflammation down first. Mm. Once you get the inflammation down, get the jaw stable and then rehabilitate the vagus nerve. And there are mm. tons of different exercises we can do for that. Oh, yes. Things like gargling, especially uh, breathing patterns and mm. things like this that we can use to increase vagal tone. And by mm. increasing vagal tone, quite often we can improve palate function, improve mm. throat function. And yeah. that sometimes opens things up enough mm. to reduce things like snoring and stuff like this. Mm. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're cured of their sleep apnea, mm. but sometimes it makes it to the point where the level that they're having is no longer clinically significant mm. as well. Um, so sometimes we can kind of reduce the need for splints and things, and mm. other times, you know, that little bit of uh, improvement means if they don't have their splints with them overnight and they've mm. gone away and left them, they can still kind of function without mm. uh, crashing and things yeah. like this. Mm. And that is correct, yeah. That, there's more and more research coming out now looking to this muscle tonicity and training these oral and breathing muscles to work better, especially yeah. since as we age, the tonicity is always going to get worse. So um, they're doing more and more research into um, teaching patients um, to like strengthen these oral breathing muscles. And um, the conference I was in recently, they were saying they're doing research, uh, they're just starting research next year in Brazil because the people who are most trained in this, these muscle training in Brazil, they're going to start a study next year to see if they can quantify which muscles to train and how to train them wow. exactly. That is amazing. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing some new research in a few years saying, hey, now we know your tongue is weak or your throat is weak, you have to do this exercise this many times at this intensity, etc., to strengthen it. And we may be able to stop or cure sleep apnea and not have to rely on these splints or orthodontics or anything like that. Yeah, it's really yeah. positive heading forward. Yeah, like mm. the, the world is just blowing up with the research in neurology and, mm. and these areas. Uh, long yeah. gone are the days of, hey, let's mm. just try and hide it. Yeah. We're now actually trying to move forward and develop mm. new methods and, and ways of, of mm. correcting all this stuff, which is yeah. just incredible. It's really exciting times. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Thank Always you very much. amazing catching up with Same you. Here. It's a, a pleasure. in your brain, man. <laughs> Same it's so much fun when we get together all the time. It's oh, always it. great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Trev. And talking <laughs> today. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, just post them down below, guys. Uh, Damon and I are happy to have a chat with you about it all. Um, if you need any help with anything, um, feel free to contact Damon. What's the best place for people to contact you? Uh, our website is uh, melbourne-dentalsleepclinic.com.au, so you'll see the link as well. And um, yeah, that's the best way to get in touch. Yep, and you can always get in contact with me, message me if you need to, via our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash spinewisehp. Anyway guys, thanks for watching, uh, it's been another great time here with uh, Dames again, thanks for coming in and having a chat with us mate. I uh, hope you got something out of today, uh, we really want to try and give you an idea that hey there are options other than CPAP when it comes to sleep apnea and the future is looking brighter and brighter and brighter with this condition as we head forward. Thanks for watching guys and uh, we'll catch you soon, see, see you guys. guys.